It's uh, Benjamin Douglas Ray with another edition here of Sustainable Cannabis TV. I'm here with Justin Johnson. How are you today? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet. You know, I, I need to mention that we've got a sponsor now. It's uh, 8 Saints CBD. So you can find them at 8saintsbrand.com. And that might be something that they should talk to you about after this, you know, after we talk about your platform. Um, but Justin is the CEO and founder of Bud's feed.com. And it's a platform for cannabis entrepreneurs to launch ancillary products. Uh, Justin's been in the industry for a long time. Uh, he's got great experience and I'm really happy to have you here today. Yeah, great to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity and we should definitely talk about the, talk about the sponsor. There's a lot we can do to uh, get them some exposure on budsfeed.com. Awesome. Thanks. Well, so tell us a bit about, you know, how you came to start this business and what got you to this point. Yeah, you know, I spent 15 years in the traditional advertising uh, industry uh, and really my career was centered around the explosion of social media. So uh, I like to joke that I was probably one of the first people to run a Facebook ad. Um, and, 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 you know, I spent a lot of time uh, uh, doing that. Um, I, I felt like there was a real uh, challenge that, you know, cannabis has been a part of my life for a long time. And I felt like there was a real challenge that cannabis companies faced um, in not being able to promote their products. Um, mm -hmm. You know, obviously not with paid ads at all um, in many cases, but, but also just organically people getting shut down on Instagram. And so I wanted to create a place where people could, uh, you know, share cannabis related products and services and, and create a place where, people can learn about those, discover them. And um, I didn't want to do it like a traditional publisher. I felt like the publishing model, again, you know, being in the social media world, watching what's what that's done to the traditional publishing world, I wanted to create um, create something where really the users generated, generated the content. And, you know, the cannabis industry, what's really interesting about it is that it's always been about brands even when it was a guy with his backyard farm growing OG Kush, yeah. um, it was OG Kush, right? It was the brand. And right. so um, it's one of those industries where most of the content out there is really about what's happening in in the industry or, or with a brand. So um, you know, I wanted to create a platform where entrepreneurs or connoisseurs even that really love a brand can you know join and what I call seed a product on the site. Um, you know, and and that was really the goal. So th that was the genesis of it. And, uh, um, you know, started working on an MVP about two years ago, um, actually started, you know, as I was building the platform, I, I started with a newsletter to about 100 people and um, have just watched it grow since then. So that that's, uh, and, and I mean, probably over the last six months, I've, I've seen explosive growth. So we're on a really good trajectory now. You know, when you're talking about the uh, the Facebook advertising and stuff like that, I remember when we had our MIP, you know, we had to build three or four different Instagram profiles with different names because in the industry here at the time in Colorado, uh, accounts were just getting shut down. So you could have a huge following and it would just disappear, you know, for violating, uh, you know, the policies of the platform. And it's yeah. still there today. You can't use Google. You can't use Facebook. You can't use Instagram. And it's uh, it is a challenge, and so I think platforms like yours to be able to do that, as well as speaking here on LinkedIn, are great for viewers uh, to find information. Because I don't think LinkedIn is going to get shut down anytime soon, and you know it's just a great outlet to talk business because people need to know a lot about the industry. It's so fractured that you know all this information like how do you get information out how do you know what's real other than just googling stuff and if it's not going to show up in google then how do you as a cannabis company actually promote your products without saying too much that you won't be there tomorrow yeah and it's you know there's a stat that i've read uh recently that you know even today if you look at traditional media buying which is the the, the you know the job of purchasing the placement for your advertising um, the majority, about 80% of the media buying in the cannabis industry is actually done through influencers. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we need more outlets and there, there's other apps that are coming out, which is great. And, and those are the types of things that can be shared on BudsFeed too. Like, you know, it doesn't have to be 
uh, cannabis itself. It doesn't have to be a pipe or, or anything like that. It can be a new cannabis app. I'm really trying to get exposure for anybody who's building something new and innovative in the space. And uh, LinkedIn has been great. I think LinkedIn recognizes that it's a real industry. B of A actually just put out a really amazing report on the 2021 industry uh, and, and financially what it's going to look like. Um, so I think LinkedIn kind of realizes that it's, you know, we're not, a, you know, we're not out here, you know, just trying to talk about weed. Um, you know, we're here talking about the industry of cannabis. So it's been a good resource too. And, you know, the problem with a lot of the other platforms is not, not so much that they, um, they don't allow it. It's that they, they basically have one policy in their, in their terms of service that says <clears throat> cannabis is considered a federally legal substance and we can't al allow it to be promoted. That's mm -hmm. the only line that exists in the terms of service of most, of most of these platforms. So it's, um, it's more so instead of being against it, they're really just abstinent on the topic. Well, I know, I know that for a fact from the, from the, the uh, eight saints here, it's, organic hemp, non-THC, and it still falls under the same kind of federal guidelines for advertising. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and that's, you know, it's, it's, it's for consumables. Like they're still, they're allowing you to do topicals now on, on Facebook, I think, or they, you know, they won't flag you as quickly if you're doing a topical form of CBD, but if you're ingesting it, it's a totally different thing. So I, you know, I, I kind of get that, but we're at the place now where, you know, really, with Epidiolex being approved by the FDA, you know, in, in my opinion, that that the FDA has approved some form of CBD. We should we should be able to, um, as long as people are doing you know proper lab testing and not selling products that are going to hurt people. I know that's their main concern. Well, mm -hmm. their concern is getting sued by the or pursued by the federal government. Right. Um, but you know, it's it's as long as people are putting out good products that aren't hurting people, that you know they should have the ability to advertise. I get a lot stranger advertising on on facebook i mean i i would i would say that um that brand's products are probably a lot safer than johnny walker <laughs> yeah no it's, it's an arguable point for sure uh comparing side by side it's true uh been true for a long time yeah you know so uh actually yesterday you may have seen this in ad age there was an article about branded content branded lifestyle content and how it's going to be so much more kind of the golden age for cannabis companies coming up in 2021 that there will be so many more um, individual magazines or some publishers that have magazines where there will be allowed advertising specifically in print advertising but also just all of the lifestyle content that can be created around not just the product but really what the lifestyle is and that you could be you know 21 and over, you know, medical, you could be a bit younger than that, but it's still around the lifestyle, still around curing or healing and all the way up to 80, 90, you know, whatever that is. Maybe it helps you play tennis better. If you have a CBD, it, it makes your joints, you know, less, less tight when you're 90 years old playing tennis. So that's the lifestyle aspect that I think is there are really big growth opportunities in this industry for sure. Yeah. And I think a lot of that, a lot of that lifestyle content is going to come through, um, it's really going to come through, uh, you know, individuals, right? It's the easiest way for some of the brands to get around it right now is if it's, if it's being said by a professional athlete, like, you know, Rob Gronkowski is invested in, in, in and yeah. involved in a CBD company, right? For, yeah. you know, one of the biggest NFL stars in the world. Um, you know, they're obviously doing that for a reason. You know, you look at Canopy Growth, their strategy with the, the you know, uh, Martha Stewart, Snoop, you know, all of these people that they're developing products for, they know that those people can go hold a concert or have a press conference and they can talk about it without um, being the ones who make the claims. Cause that's where it really gets dangerous for people is um, while we know um, that CBD helps with inflammation, um, helps with things like anxiety, undoubtedly in my mind, um, you know, we're just not allowed to say it, which is really tough. So through, through things like lifestyle content, um, which has really been, you know, since the rise of, of, of personal publishing, that's kind of been the MO for marketing, right? Trying to find mm -hmm. that, that influencer or that blogger or somebody who, um, who, who, who can captivate an audience and really speak truly and authentically to people without the risk of being, you know, pursued by um, the FDA or, or the FCC or, or, you know, a federal regulatory organization. Right. 
I mean, could you imagine 15 years ago, uh, Snoop Dogg and Martha Stewart sitting down having a conversation about weed? I kind of think maybe they did and we just didn't <laughs> know about it. But yeah, not publicly. I mean, I it's funny. I'm part of the, uh, uh, the New York uh, Cannabis Industry Association here and in, in, um, both in, in uh, the city as well as the uh, Hudson Valley chapter. Mm. And, you know, um, some some very prominent attorneys that are in the space, including um, uh, Dave, who was the, the the legal counsel for High Time some uh, uh, a while back, and it's really interesting because he said, you know, if we we had a massive meeting before all this COVID stuff hit, and there was probably like a hundred people there, and there was a bar, and it was really fun, and and he he started out by saying, you know, if we were to do this 15 years ago, I could have lost my, you know, my bar association, mm -hmm. my license because of like, uh, you know, this like federal like I don't, I don't think collusion is the right term, but like you know, we're colluding to, to break federal laws together. And, and now it's, yeah, it's come so far. It's amazing. Yeah. Now, now it's kind of called like uh collaboration instead of. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Which yeah. Well, you know, 33% of this country has access to adult use cannabis now with the recent passing of laws. Um, you know, I think it's something around 70% has access to medical. There's only a handful of States that are stalwarts and really aren't, aren't giving people, um, the access to the medicine and, and, you know, the tides are changing. The recent, there's a recent Pew, uh, Pew study, um, Pew Research Institute that showed, and I think there's also a Gallup poll that showed similar numbers. We're talking about 66 to 70% of Americans approve of legalization. Mm. So, you know, um, I think we're, we're reaching a point where, uh, there's no public outcry over it, right? Like when the war on drugs was really in its full swing, um, something like this would create this, you know, um, this massive public outcry. And, and I think that people are just more accepting of it now. And, and really the people that aren't accepting of it are in the minority and are, are um, you know, th their, their voices are not as loud as they used to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. You know, your, your platform, and I was uh, looking at that this, this morning, it looks more like it's, um, you know, not not a typical publisher, and you touched on that when you first talked about that. That it really is more of a social platform. Mm -hmm. And you know, how did you make that decision to to be more kind of? Well, I, I get to me, it's more authentic. I mean, what were your your goals around that? Yeah, there's a few things. Um, one, I you know, I feel like publishers are in a tough spot with the rise of social media. Um, you know, you have to pay a lot of money to get. Um, you know, editorial and good editorial and good journalists to deserve to get paid. You know, the web developers that maintain those platforms and the ad sales teams that try to sustain those platforms, they, they, you know, they uh, deserve to get paid. And I, you know, as a, as a bootstrap startup, it was really, you know, hard to think about how I was going to do that. Um, on the other side, uh, I think I have a good understanding and opinion about the cannabis industry. I have a, my, my thoughts and, um, uh, uh, opinions on on all the different products that are in the category, but for as much as I know, I only know ten percent, right? right? So yeah. there's a much bigger world out there, and I just feel like um, if I built a place where people could come and contribute and share their stuff, and and really giving that you know brands an opportunity to, to contribute where it, it benefits them and, and they're incentivized to do it. Um, that I would get better results. And, and frankly, I would discover cool new stuff that I would have never just discovered doing a Google search or, or something like that. So um, I was inspired by platforms like ProductHunt.com and Reddit and the way that those platforms worked, um, you know, in which people submitted stuff and then the best stuff kind of rose to the top based on mm -hmm. people voting and, 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 and having conversations about it. So, so that was it looked of, like a combination of uh, user-generated content and curated. You know, yep. you need to make sure that it's good for the the viewers. Uh, but it, it's it, that community driven model does seem so positive. Like everything on there seems like a positive vibe. And I, you know, I don't know if that's something you manufacture or if that's just the nature of the culture on the site. Yeah, it's it's a little bit of both. So right now, um, it, it is curated. It's it's pre moderated. So people submit their content. I review it usually within 24 to 48 hours. I make sure that, you know, it's articulate, it's well-written, people are representing themselves well, there's good photographs, um, that they use proper links to go purchase the products. 
Um, and then I usually curate what goes live on a given week, usually dropping somewhere between three and four new products. Um, and so even if a brand uploads like 20 products, I will, I will distribute that across multiple weeks. So it's not just no. a, you know, a hit to the site and it is a positive vibes only community. It's not a place where you come to complain about a product that you didn't like. Um, it's a place to discover products that you should love. And so, you know, with most of the products being seeded by, you know, quote unquote connoisseurs or fans of these brands or the brands themselves, um, they're generally putting themselves, you know, they're putting their best foot forward. And that's, that's what we want. We want people to, to share things they're proud of or things that they love and not, not things that they hate. Cause there's, there's no, there's no space for that. There's plenty of places to go complain about stuff that you don't like. This yeah. is about finding cool new stuff every single day. Yeah. It's like the cool hunter type stuff. You know, you're, you're, you're curating positive stuff, uh, good new products. I think it's, I think it's, it's a great model. I really like that. Well, let's talk about the, the kind of backend side, you know, when you, you know, you're, you're saying this isn't a, a platform for entrepreneurs to, to launch cannabis products, but a lot of times entrepreneurs, they don't have a lot of information. They don't know what to do. Like you said, only you only know ten percent. And on the show, we've talked a lot about getting consultants and doing. You know, uh, there are a lot of pieces to having a successful cannabis company. It isn't just like you create a product and you put it up on your site, and boom, you make a million dollars. You know, there's right. there's so much that you have to do in a company, and it looks like, and from talking to you, that you do help with um, you help entrepreneurs grow their business, and you're really acting as a I mean, I would say it's almost like a, a virtual incubator and a connector to grow, to help them grow their business. Can you talk about that some? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, the, the whole goal is to, to help elevate these people and, and, and give them, you know, at, at, at base level, you know, a free place to share their product, build backlinks, expose themselves to a new audience. And if they make it in my top five seeds, they get featured in my social content, my email newsletter. Um, and a few other kind of distribution outlets. And that's, you know, right from the value or right from the beginning, I'm trying to create value for them. And what that generally results in is a good relationship with these people. And, um, you know, whether big or small, often these entrepreneurs will reach out. They had a good successful, you know, launch on BuzzFeed and, and they, you know, they have questions like, Hey, do you have a cannabis related accountant, um, that you would recommend? Mm -hmm. And I do. Do you have a cannabis, you know, a trademark lawyer that's good for for cannabis brands? And I do, and um, you know, and, and so I do. In, instead of littering uh, the site with ads and again trying to follow that traditional publisher model, I actually try to develop good relationships, add value up front, and then when these entrepreneurs need help taking that next step. I really try to broker B2B deals. And that's really the way that I try to try to do my work. And, and really, you know, the way that I put it to people is if at the end of the day, a company only has $10,000 in operational capital and they're really trying to bootstrap this idea in a company, um, am I really going to try to take $5,000 from them for, for an advertising deal? Or am I trying to, um, you know, or, or should they really get that accountant or should they go get a website developer that's going to build them a great website? I would argue that there's more value in doing those other things. Like I, you know, there's value to advertising on, on, on BuzzFeed as well. But um, I think that there's a lot of fundamental business knowledge and, and, and uh, resources that people need to have to be successful. So, um, and those companies aren't hurting, right? The accounting firms, the legal firms, like they're, they're booming uh, right, right now. And, and so for them to be able to kind of fund the operation, um, you know, that's a, that, that, that um, allows me to, to not litter the site with advertising and pop-ups and all that kind of stuff. And um, personally, you know, I spent 15 years in the advertising industry, help building some of the biggest brands, you know, uh, a litany of Unilever products, uh, Frito-Lay, PepsiCo, American Express. And so, you know, another big thing that people will come to is, is to me for is, is like helping them launch their brand. You know, they like my creative, they like that kind of stuff. So um, in, in some cases, uh, one of the most recent cases, actually, um, I helped launch a company called Chill and it's the fir world's first uh, stainless steel vacuum insulated smoking device. Um, 
and and you know it's a very very organic story i was discovered by the founder uh on buzzfeed um we had a conversation about whether or not it would be a cool product and and you know he he effectively asked me like can you help me kind of bring this to life and mm. and we did we built the brand we built the website we've uh, inked our wholesale deals we're working with our lawyers and our accountants on trademarks and and our bookkeeping and and so we've really built the business from scratch together um so that's a really exciting story but yeah my whole my my goal is to get add that value early on and then as these companies grow um you know help them find the resources they need to grow you know well that it provides i mean it's huge credit huge credibility when you've done it yourself you know you're not just saying go talk to this attorney here's what you know go talk to these people you're actually saying i did this and i've launched a product and so um, you know, people can see successful and that, that one product you're talking about, that's like the water pipe, the Yeti water pipe, you know, isn't it? It's like, it's got huge, it's got huge, uh, uh opportunity. I think, I mean, it's a, it's a good time for that. It's been pretty wild. It's been, uh, it's very successful at, at, at wholesale right now, which has been great. And yeah, it's, it's, uh, we have a patent on the vacuum insulation, so it keeps your, your water, uh, cold for up to 12 hours, uh, depending on, you know, obviously conditions. Uh, and we also have a patented ceramic uh, interior coating. So, you know, people that are concerned about the concept of metal, um, it actually, um, you know, cleans and has an interior just like glass. Wow, it's cool. Well, what, what products do you see coming up this year that you're excited about, um, you know, that, that have come through your site? Like, you know, not not necessarily the trends in the industry, but specifically for products. What's what's cool that you're seeing now? I think there's a lot of just really unique innovation coming from all over the place. Um, I think uh, one of the ones I just posted on my Instagram today is the Bellow Vapor Tap, which is a really cool new consumption method for um, uh, uh, using uh, five ten thread carts uh, cartridges. Mm -hmm. It's basically a chalice that you can fill with uh with with your vapor and you can kind of sip it casually like you would wine um i think there's a lot of unique beverages that are coming out um so i guess in the ancillary space you have you know the bellow vapor tap um uh a recent one that just came out was uh, a, a a bowl piece for a water pipe called bowls b-o-w-l-z and they have a uh it's a, a air uh aircraft grade aluminum but mm. it's magnetic. So after you take your hit, you can pull it apart and tch, tch, clean it up and put it mm. back together. Um, another one that I've really been fond of is the clinger. It's a nice little attachment that just sits, you know, it, it attaches to your lighter and it's got a little dube tube. So you can, mm. you know, carry a, a, a cigarette with you wherever you go. Um, and so, you know, those, those are really interesting on the ancillary space. I think in the, um, in the, consumer space uh i really think the beverage industry is really interesting because as we get towards a more legal space in all of these states i think people need a place to be able to consume other than their homes and i think beverages are going to be uh, an interesting foray into like social consumption like if we can go somewhere and drink hard liquor why can we not go drink a five milligram beverage um there's a there's a great beverage that's actually actually going to be coming out called Klaus by Warren Bobrow, who is you know known for his mixology and 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 being one of the best kind of uh, cocktail mixologists in the world. Um, he's actually coming out with his own canned beverage called Klaus in uh, in California, which is exciting. So I think that's going to really, I think beverages and even some of the low dose you know, pre-rolls and stuff like that, that have, you know, mix of CBD and THC where people can casually hang out and not get completely faced. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, socially, socially, because now, I mean, you know, the industry typically has had challenges with dosing, you know, and if you, if you're, especially if you're using trim in a product, you don't know, even if it's the same product, you know, week to week or whatever, it's, it's not going to be consistent. So that's a big part is that regulation, low dosing, I think is, I agree, that's going to be uh, coming up pretty big, especially in beverages or something that's consumed fast. I yeah. think it's going to be a big trend this year as well. Well, because, yeah, I mean, when you go to a bar, you don't necessarily drink a beer. You drink three beers, you know. Yeah. So, right. they, you know, if you're if you're doing a five milligram beverage with uh, like in, in, in Warren's drink, it's live resin. Um, 
you know, you can have 15 milligrams and you'll feel a little, you'll be, you'll be buzzed for sure. But, um, you know, that's, that, that's a safe amount to consume, you know, right. and, 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 you know, right about the, you know, the right amount of volume that you're going to be like, okay, after three, I'm, I'm good. And, and, you know, you're feeling good just like you would with a beer. There's a reason that beer is 3.5%, you know? Yeah. It could be a lot more. I mean, it could, it could be, but you're not going to have a, a full beer full of like, you know, 151 or something you're just not going to do it you know? right right unless you're in college or, or a problematic drinker that's right yeah not socially <laughs> probably so. yeah 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 you're, you're drinking that alone that's right well so what about on the the cannabis um you know i guess business side coming up over this year you know what opportunities do you see that are opening up based on what happened this past year with covid and all the ups and downs what are you looking forward to well, I, you know, I actually wrote an article in Benzinga recently about this, um, about New York in general. And, and you know, I think one major, I, I've written a couple articles about COVID because I think COVID has shown that it's, um, especially as people need to cope with stress, they're, they're, they're locked at home and they're trying to be responsible, you know, boredom kicks in, you know, all these things. It's really been deemed as, as essential. And mm -hmm. I think that I think a lot of the politicians are finally realizing that, you know, it's you can you can scream it from the rooftops. But until you you can get the people in power to start echoing that same sentiment, it really doesn't do much. And so I think we've seen that it, it is seen as essential. I think we're seeing, um, you know, Illinois is about to hit a billion dollars in sales this year. Colorado hit a billion last year and they have nowhere near the population of Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, Massachusetts, I think is, is about to pull a B, uh, you know, so, so I think all of that, you know, the States that are seeing that happening are saying, Oh, okay. So cannabis is something that can, you know, it, it's good, good, you know, generally for the mental health of our people, it's, it's essential. Um, it can create much gener much needed revenue for our economy, which is we have not seen the downturn yet. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. it's going to happen and, and we're going to need that extra revenue. And I also think in places like New York, where I live, where you do have, um, you know, larger minority populations, you know, Co Colorado is a little less diverse than, than a place like New York. I think they're really seeing like, that it's a good way to repair our, our culture too. There's a lot of people that have been um, put away or otherwise, um, you know, really subjected to horrible behavior over the plant. And I think they're seeing it now as a way to um, potentially, um, you know, fix a lot of the issues that we have and, and, you know, give, give people that were most impacted by the war on drugs an opportunity to, um, you know, get up, get up in the world, build, build that uh, generational wealth for their own families. And, and in, in many cases do something that they're already passionate about. You know, there's a lot of people that have been, you know, I joke with people all the time that some of the best talent in this industry is probably still behind bars. Hmm. Wow. That's an interesting comment. And it's probably true. You know, there, there is a lot of uh, reform going on now to, to not only limit that, but uh, you know, release people. So that's a, that's a, it's, it's true. I don't know if it's, a, a, yeah, it's a very interesting concept thinking about that. So I, we will see that over time. You know, I think yeah. we will see much more of that, especially what happened this year and convergence of politics and, you know, social inequity and COVID all hit at the same time, you know? So, yeah. It was an explosion. You know, everybody sat at home for, you know, three, four months. And then, you know, we saw some heinous kind of things happen in public and it just, it popped, you know, it's, yeah. it's, we got to, there's a lot, there's a lot clearly to fix. And, um, I think it, I think it is a, a healing plant and I think it, you know, it, 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 it can be used for a lot of fun, but it's also a medicine and it's, a it's a, a you know, it's a, something that brings people together socially and, uh, it's something that can create wealth for people. And I think that those are all things that, that really um, uh, are, are important. And, uh, you know, the, the redistribution of that, uh, um, you know, it's very rare that you sit, like if you thought about cannabis as gold, right? Mm -hmm. We've mined the hell out of our, out of our hills for gold, right? Yeah. And silver and all that stuff. If you're, 
if you really think about it, it's like you've basically been sitting on a pile of gold for five to six decades and you're now just realizing that you want to mine it. It's a and, really good point. Yeah. You know, and so so it's uh it, it's very rare that a new industry uh creates itself like that, you know, and it's I know it's not new, but in terms of the legal industry, um it's very rare that that something that is this new and this big, you know, it's on the scale of like Airbnb flipping the flipping the um the hotel industry upside down. I think it's 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 bigger than that, frankly. Yeah, and we're not even talking about uh, agricultural hemp. Yeah, you know, I mean, when you add that into it, it's monstrous, really, the opportunity. I honestly think hemp is the reason, well, and there's 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 a lot of data that points to this, that hemp is the reason that potentially it became illegal because there's people in the cotton and the timber and the, the corn, you know, industries and lobbies that, you know, they want to make the ethanol or they want to make the paper. And, uh, you know, those, those are things that... Uh, you know, pose the threat to other industries. But you go back, you know, to our Declaration of Independence written on hemp paper, uh, it's, it's, it's ingrained both in our society and it's, you know, that's the, that's the power of political propaganda, right? Yeah. Um, and so I also think it's, it's innate to our bodies, you know, our endocannabinoid systems and, 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 you know, the fact that we have receptors to accept these things. Um, and it's not about getting high. It's, it's about, our body needing just the same way we need vitamin D and vitamin C. Um, we need cannabinoids to be healthy, you know? Yeah. There it's naturally producing, uh, in, within our body. So it, it goes along with that and helps it function smoothly. Right. Yeah. yeah it's so balanced. it's, it's amazing to really, you know, since I got in the industry, just to really look at the history and be like, wow, who, the people that took this away, there was a very, you know, uh, obvious plan, you know, um, and, and, the, you know, uh, long term, and it, it's probably impacted our national health a lot that, that we haven't had access to these things. Probably. Well, all, good things all going forward. Uh, you know, no matter what it is, I think we're headed in the right direction. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very excited. I'm bullish on obviously New Jersey. I'm bullish on, uh, you know, Cuomo, uh, you know, just two days ago is, you know, he's promised it a couple times, but I think this is the year where, where legalization could really be passed in New York and we could have, you know, legal cannabis in New York. That's not our lackluster medical program or, you know, I'm glad we have medical, but, but pe patients don't have the, the, um, the products that they need in New York. So I'm really, um, as, as a, tr a West coast transplant who grew up in Washington, who li now lives in New York, I'm really excited, um, that the East Coast is about to get this opportunity with Jersey and, and and hopefully soon New York and obviously with Boston it's 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 about to be a powerhouse over here. Yeah, I mean it's not going backward anytime soon. It'll just be a matter of time. Yeah, and we'll see with decriminal. You know, I, I don't want to count my chickens before they hatch. I don't see it becoming federally legal at any point soon, based on the recent comments from Merrick Garland and and you know uh, his his you know, he, he'll effectively want the DEA to, to continue to regulate it and classify it. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think, you know, we are probably marching towards de decriminalization, um, you know, relatively soon. And that's going to open up a lot of opportunities. It's going to make um, interstate commerce potentially possible. Yep. It's going to, it's going to make um, things like paraphernalia won't exist anymore. Cause if it's not illegal, then, paraphernalia can't be a thing, you know, so that opens up a lot of channels for people who don't want to be plant touching, but want to develop a product and are, mm -hmm. are concerned about, you know, the, the, the legal implications of that. So uh, decrim, decrim nationally could be a, um, something that happens very soon. And, and uh, uh, it's not as good as, you know, federal legalization necessarily, but it's a big, it's a big deal. Well, those uh, packs that you were talking about, the interstate commerce, I think that that's what will happen first is two or three states that are next to one another, they're going to form some sort of a pack so that you can go across state lines, you can conduct business, it'll be better for the economy, you know, whether that's in the, you know, Northwest or the Northeast or wherever that is, I definitely see that coming relatively soon. I mean, I, again, we can't we don't have crystal ball, but in the next couple of years, because there's really no reason why that shouldn't happen if the right. states next to one another are in agreement, you know, wreck in medical. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm being from Washington State, you know, the Cascade hops that we grow out there, that's what everybody buys for their IPAs. You know, that's that's how that industry makes money. It's how that's how, you know, farmers are able to to exist. Otherwise, you know, you allow a state like Oregon or or even Washington, you give out too many licenses and the bottom falls out. You know, you're selling pounds for four hundred dollars and 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 farmers can't exist like that. They need to be able to um to sell their product to as many people as possible and and scale their operations to to be successful as farmers. I mean, frankly, for farmers to be successful, um, the traditional model is that they're going to need government subsidies. Unfortunately, that's that's how our our food system works today. But um, yeah, being able to you know, <laughs> literally Medford, Oregon, and Northern California are you know five minutes apart. The fact that they can't just you know carry a couple pounds across you know, is it's insanity. Yeah, it'll, it'll change. Well, Justin, I want to thank you for being on this show. How can people get a hold of you? Uh, obviously on buzzfeed dot, or sorry, uh, buds. I don't know what you're talking about. B-U-D-S-F-E-E-D.com, right? Buzzfeed, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. And then what's your, your email and the best way for people to get a hold of you? Yeah, for sure. So if you go to buzzfeed.com, there's actually a little chat bubble in the bottom right. I respond to all those messages. So that's the easiest way to get a hold of me. Uh, you can email me at justin at budsfeed.com uh, and follow us on social. We're at budsfeed underscore on most channels because uh, someone someone took the one without the underscore. But uh, yeah, so uh, you know, follow us on social too. I'm 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 uh, well. I'm not the only one uh, running those channels. I, I I do respond to everybody that reaches out. Great. Well, thanks for being on the show, and I look forward to talking to you again. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate All it, right, Benjamin. See ya. All right. See ya. Bye.